Hello, everybody, and welcome back to CCA's uh, Medical Minute. I am uh, thrilled and honored to be back here today with Jill Hunt, one of my, what we call the OGs. The OGs. The OGs of the Medical Minute. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I haven't been here, I mean, and I've missed it. I haven't been here in almost four months, so we, we checked that today. Uh, March 12th, I think, was the last time I was in this seat. Um, and I think I actually was in this seat. Um, but anyway, it's great to be back. Good and to have so, you back. We'll talk about a couple of things today. Um, I'll explain a little bit later why, I'm where, why I have my best of oncology blanket. Yes. Uh, there is a reason for that. I think everybody should have a best of oncology <laughs> blanket. These are probably the softest, they comfiest nice. blankets. To... They, they are pretty nice. Yes. I mean, it's probably, it probably doesn't justify going all the way through medical school and everything else, but it, it, it is a nice blanket if you're an yes. oncologist and you come to our symposium. Yes. On yes. November 2nd this year. So anyway, but anyway, great to be back. Like I said, um, I checked today just out of curiosity, Jill, because the reason why I haven't been here in about four months is because all sorts of stuff has happened since then, yes. um, with my cancer case, which is now coming up on 11 years old. And so, um, we need a Steve update. Yeah, we need a Steve update. <laughs> There's a lot. And I do, I do, I do have a, at least a short list of those things, but, um, but in the, in between, um, I've been just blessed to be in such a great supportive uh, work environment because I was able to go down, uh, enter a clinical trial down at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And I actually spent six weeks there. Six it was weeks. longer. Yeah, probably, probably was. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it felt like 87. Oh, I, can, I can tell you it felt like a lot longer. Um, but it was uh, six weeks um, in and out of the hospital for uh, an inpatient clinical trial. I mean, I really do feel like this is a really great place to work and yeah. there would be way better places to hang out than <laughs> in a hospital room at I MD agree. Anderson. But yeah, I mean, I agree. you do you. <laughs> but you guys, you guys kept things going while I was gone, which was great. And uh, everybody was incredibly supportive. So um, I'll get around to a couple of thank yous a little bit later. But I did check when I was last here on March the 12th, my PSA, um, which is, you know, a measurement tool for um, prostate cancer. It's not necessarily always perfect in, in judging how it advanced. is not the end all be all. Yeah, it's but not. It's, it's a guideline. It's a um, tool. And so mine, when I checked, it was 22.7 on March 12th. What, uh, June 10th was 50, <laughs> was 57, which is not a good number either. Mm -mm. Um, wrong direction. Wrong direction. Yes. And um, I mean, typically the, the, you measure cancer at four and that's even a little bit different because I don't have a prostate gland and, mm -hmm. and four is my four is different you're, than somebody else's with no prostate. Your PSA should be zero. Yeah, exactly. So I'm at least 57 worse than that. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> just not Correct. So, uh, anyway, so that long story short, I was in that clinical trial. I was in it for, um, I think I had five injections. It was, it's called a first in man trial. So this is the first time this drug had been given, certainly at this strength level to a person. And as it turns out, I was the only person in the trial. So um, you can imagine the level of scrutiny and monitoring that I had with every single thing that happened. So I do remember the conversations that you could not make it a full 30 minutes right. without someone coming into oh, your room. I know. So to either stick me for blood or whatever it was, but it was mm -hmm. always something or, or maybe vitals, but there's yes. always something going on. So, yes. um, but uh, unfortunately on that trial, um, there's kind of two things. One is that I did have some difficulties with, it was an immunotherapy based trial. So I did have some physical responses that were tough and difficult to deal with. The biggest problem though, which is what caused me to not be in the trial now is that I, my PSA began pro progressing. Mm -hmm. There were kind of evidence that my disease was progressing a while on the trial drug. And that's pretty much always going to get you booted, right? Correct. Okay. So that's what happened. So, um, so I'm back here in Cincinnati and looking for, whatever my next treatment is. Uh, I just wrapped up uh, radiation to my uh, thoracic spine um, mm -hmm. after having done lumbar spine early in this year. So I've, I guess about six or seven spots where cancer has been found on my spine. And then this most recent thing by way of an update is that I've got spots where it's compressing my spinal cord. Correct. Um, which we're having to move very carefully around try to get inflammation down and just make sure to, to mitigate any paralysis risk. Correct. Correct. Okay. Or any neurologic changes whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so, uh, we're, that brings me to a segment that I'm going to call, this is a partial list. 
crazy random shit that's happened to me since this all started. So I, I think that's a good segue. <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. But um, it, did you did you make like the top ten? Uh, there, I'm pretty a, sure there's, there's, about, there's there's about eight or ten here. Okay, um, some new stuff, uh, but like stuff that like stuff that was just never an issue before. Like, well, I was in a trial down in MD Anderson before. Like, there was one day they came in. And I was in pretty serious AFib. I mean, I, I didn't, mm-hmm. I, I never had it before. Medical term, AFib. AFib, uh, atrial fibrillation. Yes, it and so but heart. it's when your heart's beating funky. Okay, all right, so there you go. We um, always promised. All right. <laughs> Just because you've been through a clinical trial now does not mean that you get to start oh, throwing did, out I random. Did, I did shortcut you do not, that. Yes. I'm sorry See? about that. All right, gotcha, atrial fibrillation. Yes. Um, so I spent uh, a night in the cardiac unit, uh, which was quite a surprise because I'd never had anything like that before. Um, let's see, I had, I've developed something, um, I don't know if it's still an issue yet because I'm so careful that called orthostatic hypotension. Yeah. That means don't stand up too fast. Yeah. Cause I, I've passed out several times, one time into my dog's water bowl. Yes. I remember that. Call. Um, so, <laughs> that's right. I didn't yes. call you. I forgot about that. <laughs> yes. Um, so anyway, um, and, one, and I do believe I remember her distinctly saying he's currently laying in the dog's bowl. <laughs> it was not fun. <laughs> No, it was not fun. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's happened a couple of times. So I'm really careful with that now as I move around. Um, One of the things that happened during the trial, thankfully it seems like that's now gone away, is that I developed this, this was in response to drug, this crazy random pain on my lower mandible. Like I couldn't, couldn't like. Mandible? Mandible, uh, jaw. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I couldn't really eat, I couldn't eat solid food for Mm -hmm. a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there was a period where it felt like I had a toothache and about five teeth at the same time. That Mm -hmm. was great that was a good time yeah and then um let's see right now as you know i've got i'm like i've got runaway blood clots in the bottom of my legs so that has always been part of your cancer journey okay Uh, along the way when your cancer has gotten a little bit on the move is when you have developed blood clots Okay. And so you've been on blood thinners a couple of times. And then before the trial, we wanted you off the blood thinners. Yeah. So you had the, the filter placed, which is essentially like a fancy umbrella that goes in one of your main blood vessels to catch blood clots that would potentially travel up from your lower extremities into an area that could cause some, okay. yep. some potential fatality. Um, we like to avoid that at all costs. Yeah, I agree. Um, but that is actually one of the characteristics of some of the different cancers is that it makes you a, at a higher risk to develop blood clots and you have moved into that yeah. at a warp speed, yeah. um, which has caused a significant amount of swelling to, yep. to which your is, legs, which brings me to why I have this crazy blanket over my, over um, your legs. so I can't wear, sh- I, I'm so swollen below the waist that uh with just fluids and inflammation that um i can't wear shoes yes and as you know i'm a shoe guy i know i have probably more shoes than my wife but uh, i i sitting here in my socks however i did see the sexy thigh high <laughs> compression <laughs> stockings oh, that yeah. you were wearing the other day oh, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are on the top 10 hottest <laughs> things i've ever seen <laughs> uh, uh, i know i the, I'm a little bit speechless, but uh, it's <laughs> kind of like, it's, it's my Moulin Rouge look. Yes, <laughs> yes, right. it is. All um, we need is some bedazzling going on. Those would be fabulous. So we got that. So Wine, got women, that and shoes on. rolling exactly. down the runway. Um, so let's see. Uh, and then, you, as you know, Joe, my kidneys and liver values went out of whack like they never had before. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see here, real quick. We can wrap this up, I think, here. Ah, uh, the mid spine. We talked about that, um, the spinal cord compression. And then um, yeah, I'll cut it off here, but. The kind of the random 27 pound weight loss mm-hmm. followed by probably 10 plus pounds more of just weight gain from fluids from fluid so it's been kind of a crazy ride so you've been having a real good time here yeah. lately <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. so I'm, ha- I'm i'm grateful for the days that i can kind of crawl back in here and yep. go, go back to work a little bit with you guys but uh, and clearly we're cutting you a break huh? right right <laughs> so um one of the things i wanted to talk to we've, t- we've done segments before in clinical trials um and that's kind of where I'm at there. I'm really kind of, I think we can say I'm out of FDA approved treatment options, the mm-hmm. standard of care, all that kind of yes. stuff is there's, there's not much available left for me there, but on the clinical trial front. And so we talked about the clinical trial that I was in before, mm-hmm. which is called a bi-specific antibody mm-hmm. trial where they, um, they link you get the killer T cells in your immune system to the cancer by way of however they link it. Right. Okay. 
And then, but now the trial that I'm going into now is an antibody drug conjugate, conjugate. trial. Yes. And so um, I'm going to ask Jill to talk a little bit about what that trial looks like um, and how it works because I'm certainly not qualified to do that myself. So. Okay. So um, for those of you who have never been through the process of, of looking into clinical trials, um, I'd like to show you, um, it's kind of hard to hold it with the, mi with the microphone, but we have 32 of the most intriguing pages to read um, that are part of the clinical trial consent. And it's, you know, they have to make sure that you're informed about all levels because it's research. Um, but this is a phase one, two clinical trial that is looking, it's also a first in human trial, looking at this antibody drug conjugate. And the reason that it's a phase one, two is because there's two parts to this trial. So part one is looking at, it's at least five different dosing schedules for this medication. Um, it's still given on the same um, time schedule, it's just the dose is different. Um, and so they're looking at five different, and that's common. Like they're trying to figure out, number one, which drug has, which drug dosing has the um, most efficacy, but which one, like how much of this medicine can we give somebody before we really start to ca cause a problem? Um, and, and so with all the different dosing schedules, they'll kind of compare that uh, across the board. They'll look at the, the tumor response, and then they'll also look at the, the side effect profile and, and kind of, you kind of have to find that sweet spot, not too toxic, but still getting a good drug response. So they're looking at all that. So then when you talk about an antibody drug conjugate, what that is, is that you have essentially two different types of medicines that are that are joined together the antibody in this case and I'm gonna have to sneak at my notes here but um, is a anti anti b7 h3 antibody and so what that is is b7 h3 is a protein and that protein specifically is seen in a worse prognosis um, worse overall survival um, more common in patients who develop drug resistance. Um, so kind of a, you know, you see that protein in patients who have more aggressive disease. Okay. Um, sound like anybody we know? <laughs> I think I know that is. And then the other drug that is part of this conjugate is a P1021. Oh, uh, that one. Um, yeah, that, that famous P1021. Um, so this is a new drug that has been developed. It is a drug drug class that has already been th that we know of it's called a top one in um top one inhibitor um, but this is a newer one to the to the group okay. and what this drug specifically does is inside the cancer cell it jacks up the dna okay. and the one thing about cancer cells that are different than normal healthy cells is they lack the ability to repair themselves so if you jack up the DNA in a cancer cell, it can't fix it. it. So then it ultimately causes the death of that cancer cell. So you're taking the, the antibody that is looking at that protein specifically um, that has caused the drug resistance and the poorer prognosis, and then you're taking a drug that, that essentially at the specific cancer cell messes with the DNA so that the cells die. Okay and you're marrying those two drugs. Okay. So that's what the study is looking at. And that's why, so when they refer, when I talk to um, different oncologists and things, and they refer to it as B7H3 as being the target, it's because that protein is, it's correct. That's the that's the protein. The that's the protein that they're trying to shut down that the process of that okay. protein. Because with a protein, what a protein does is it causes an action. Okay. And so we, we wanna stop the action. Okay. So one thing I wonder about with, with some of these things, because I know the one that I was in, in MD Anderson um, was a phase one first in man trial, but it didn't really have an end date. So what, with, when you see the phase mm -hmm. one slash two, I mean, does that tell me anything about how long I might be in this? Or it not? doesn't, but if you read and it's like page 87. <laughs> okay, I said it was 32 pages, so it's not really page 87. But into this informed consent, that is one of the things that it addresses. Okay. So this drug is given every three weeks 
until unacceptable toxicity. So that means side effects that are just not tolerable yeah. or disease progression. Okay. And so there's all of these guidelines. That is the one thing with a phase one, two clinical trial. They got all kinds of rules. Yeah. And so they lay it out on what they consider unacceptable toxicity or, you know, other diseases that would impact the, the, the effectiveness of the drug or the clinical trial. Um, and then obviously disease progression is, is exactly that. And, and sometimes like, I think, and this, I think this is the case in mine. Um, I'm fa fairly sure I've heard this before is let's just use this as an example. It may, it may not be like, let's say for example, your PSA rises, but it may rely more on a soft tissue scan or something that Correct. would maybe not be a specific number. It might be something that would be seen. Correct. Because yeah. there are even, there are some drugs even in standard of care right now that you could pull off the shelf that when you start to give them, the PSA initially will go up oh, okay. before it comes down. Okay. So a PSA is not the target, like the only measurable, um, confirmation of disease progression. Gotcha. Um, usually they, they want scans and just the screening process. I mean, I'm sure you can speak to, I mean, they literally just short of take hair samples. Yeah. I mean, from head to toe, they are looking at everything. I have an eye exam on Friday. I See? Mean, which was like eye exam, really? I need to, like, right. Yeah, but it's part of it. it. It's part of it because they're wanting to make sure, especially in a first in human trial, what every single baseline is for you so that if something starts to change they can they can document it as potentially being caused by the medication okay gotcha all right so um at risk i don't want to talk too much more about me and all my problems i'm getting <laughs> some nice getting some time to spend home with my dogs um and do some other things but uh, again thanks i did write out um and by the way thanks for that explanation jill because uh, that's even helpful to me because i've when I read through that, I feel like because of where I work and the people I'm surrounded with, I understand more than most patients would, but I certainly don't understand a lot of it. And so right. it's still hard to understand what you're, what it is you're signing up for. But, um, but I do want to, I, I did have a list of thank yous. I've already mentioned the team here, which has been incredibly supportive, uh, to me in every which way. Um, it, I, I wouldn't be sitting here today without everybody's support. Uh, and I appreciate that. And so, um, also I did have a, a great nursing team down at MD Anderson that looked at me, um, picked me up off the floor a couple of times when I passed out. Actually, there was this little nurse, um, her name was Lynn and, um, she was like no more than five feet tall. And one of the times I passed out, she had to get me up and she, she was like, she looked at me, she's like, you know, don't get up again because I think she was South Korean. And she's like, you are a very large man. And I'm like, <laughs> Like I'm five nine. <laughs> I don't think I'm really She's that large. Foot. Everyone's large to her. I'm not really that large. <laughs> um, but anyway, but uh, they were great, and uh, and the folks at UC Health have been great to me as well. And then uh, Liz Bonus. I wanted to mention Liz Bonus mm -hmm. at Local Twelve, who's um, followed my story. She's just been really, really great. Covered us a couple times, even down to the, when I was in the trial. She covered it, and and after I came back and started radiation on my spine, um, and she did that. Obviously, my family's my family and friends. I. Um, I, you, you learn you have friends that fall into two buckets, like the friends that want to come see you, but they take no for an answer. And then the ones that won't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And so I've got a little bit of both of those. Mm -hmm. um, and they, it's a good mix. And I've had a busy house full of people trying to bring me things. We've got an overflowing pantry full of snacks. Uh, people, my brother's bring him dinner tonight, even though I told him he doesn't need to do that. Um, but that's fantastic. And so just so you were aware. Yeah. That's what people like to do for people who have cancer. They like to feed them. No, that's true. I agree. I, I am getting my appetite back a little bit too. So that it's a good, that's good timing. Um, but yeah, my family and friends have been great. And then, um, and also I wanted to call out um, the Griffin family who have been great supporters of ours. Um, it's sitting right outside the door. The hot rod. But I have a little, uh, the green machine. It's the motorized um, scooter that uh, the Griffin family um, are lending me their, um, they had a family member that passed from prostate cancer. And so when they saw that I was struggling a little bit, they, they brought this thing to me. It's amazing. It's changed my, mm -hmm. my life would have, I wouldn't have much of a life right now without it. Let's put it that way. Um, and then of course, last but not least, my wife, Diana, um, who has just been an absolute rock star. So, um, and by the way, she's the one that breaks the motorized wheelchair down all 128 pounds of it, um, to get me around. And so, uh, she's never complained one minute. 
Um, she's been there for everything. So um, it's really just had a fantastic support. We're just all glad that you're still here on the Medical Minute, cranking it out. We'll keep it going. That's so, right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, we'll have, uh, I'm hoping to be back here more often. So uh, we'll see everybody soon and take care and have a great rest of the week. See ya.